Thank you. So the name of my talk, it's not real one actually, it is just a stop, you know, because uh, we, well, we were discussing with uh, Ed my talk one year ago. So since I travel a lot, I have a dozens talks every month. So I had no idea how to name my talk properly. So I put the first thing came into my mind, I call it Jedi Techniques. So nobody cares, it has nothing in common with uh, Star Wars, nothing in common with uh, Jedi's. So anyway, it is a stop. The proper name of my talk, it came to my mind maybe three days ago. I think the proper name should sound like this. The world is complicated and no one is an asshole. But the idea is talk about problem solving anyway, I about root cause analysis and all stuff like this. Uh, I was greatly inspired by this guy. Do you know Eliyahu Goldrat? Does anyone read his book? Who? Who did? Not too much, okay. He's maybe genius in management and business and every his book is a Bible, or to be exact, Torah, because he's Jew. Uh, Torah of management, business, and so on. So I'm going to talk a little bit about his thinking methods of theory of constraints and a little bit about my experience in leading and facilitating team retrospectives, big team retrospectives, not agile ones. Agile retrospective, as you know, it is something that uh, taking place at the end of the sprint and takes maybe one, two, three hours where you scream to each other, blame each other, call each other assholes and so on. And we are talking about big retrospectives that rest for two days at least. So in theory, in theory, solving problem is very easy. No problem at all. Just identify the root cause, then find the proper solution and just implement it. Maybe iteratively, because nothing works from first try, as all we know. And as uh, Yogi Berra said, that in theory, there is no difference between theory and practice, but in practice, there is. So I'm going to talk about all these details that came to my mind while I was thinking about practicing this stuff. So about ident identifying the root cause. First of all, uh, it Every retrospective, every problem solving session starts with an um, assumption or a uh, situation that everyone thinks they have a lot of problems. A lot of problems, pile of them. When we try to enumerate them, we have a huge list or sticky notes uh, that cover the whole wall. But what does the root cause analysis principle says to us? In this case, in case we have a lot of problems, most likely them are not independent of each other. Most likely they are somehow connected by means of uh, cause-effect links. So if we see this in more details, closer, it might happen that problem A causes problem B, problem B might cause uh, problem C, problem D as well can uh, some add effect for existence of problem C, then some elements of reality make problem F be the cause of problem D, and maybe somewhere we can find a back loop, and as Ilyaku Goldrat says, any existing, long, existing problem for a long time, something that exists for a long time, it definitely has a cycle in it. In root cause uh, links, it should have a cycle, or it exists due to core conflict. Also, I'm going to talk a little bit about core conflicts. This diagram called the current reality tree, from mathematical point of view, it's not a tree, it is a graph, but they call it tree anyway. And uh, let me give you an example from some fictional company that never happens in real life. It might happen that you come to some IT company and see the number, number of problems they face to. Oh, just for example, they could 
release new versions without full regression testing. It never happens in real life. Uh, very often they found critical bugs in production environment, just simple coincidence. Uh, developers are frequent, frequently interrupted by bug fixes, and also they or we do not have auto test and regression testing takes very long time. So it might seem that we do have a lot of problems, but when you're trying to look closer to this, it might happen that we release versions without full regression testing, and most likely it could cause that very often they found critical bugs. Not sure, but maybe. Uh, in other turn, it might be a cause for frequent interruption of developers. Also, otherwise they will be busy making auto test, but unfortunately they have to uh, make a bug fixes. Also, since they do not have auto tests, regression testing takes very long time. But this one uh, doesn't actually produce the release without full regression. If you don't have auto test, so just take more time. But maybe there is another element of reality. For example, business people always demand very fast launches. So I said it's a fictional example. So it might happen that all these problems are connected to each other. And finally, we have to deal with maybe one or two of them. It means that if we fix either of them, all other could disappear or should. It's not exactly, but it's worth to try. And uh, trees like this or diagrams like this are used too much in a Goldratt satellite program. Also, maybe genius video. Uh, I love them very much, much more than any other, you know, TV series. Uh, it's, I love this much more than South Park show. So, who knows me understood that it's very high level of appreciation. Um, very high. And he uses it very brilliantly, very nicely. But in real life, in real life, it might be not so smooth because every time someone tried to use this uh, current reality trees to find root cause for uh, solving problems, we face into some other things that make everything complicated. First of all, I will mention three main problems with uh, current reality trees in practice. Uh, poor wording, so people use not too much words, as this should. Uh, very often they use vague statements. I call it abstract bullshit. Uh, I will give you examples. Abstract bullshit. Maybe 80% of time we use vague statements in our language. And also, very often we do not have the full picture. So, what can I say about poor wordings? Uh, if I give you a task to create a current reality tree for your case, most likely we will end up with something like this. Motivation, bugs, assholes, and so on. So the main idea, the main principle behind this tool is that every box should contain a statement. Statement means that at least it should contain a verb, a noun, and some other words, not only a single word. but. Uh, Usually we think maybe we should pay by word writing on sticky notes, I don't know, but usually pe people uh, try to save words. So, for example, this tree says nothing to us actually. And it is only one rule behind this. Also, besides of this rule that every box should contain a statement, shall contain a statement. Uh, they have a pile of criteria that, for example, mentioned in this book, the, I said, uh, I heard, mm, did anyone read this one? My favorite, William Detmer. Uh, very hard to read, but very nice to have, at least. Uh, it's one first thing that make everything complicated. Another point is value statements, how it looks like. Uh, for example, I could show you a very simple 
tree, logical tree, with statements in every box. But uh, do you see that something wrong with this? By the way, the idea that top management has no strategy, I hear almost on every retrospective I facilitate. Almost every. Uh, I don't know how it happens in Latvia, in other European countries, but here we see that um, we have a lot of people that have deep understanding of international economy, how to run global business, how to uh, solve world greatest problems, but unfortunately they have no time to deal with this because all of them have full-time job as a taxi drivers. So, uh, <laughs> approximately the same happens in the retrospectives. Uh, maybe a programmer became a senior, oh no, no, not even senior, middle one, or, or end up with a junior developer as soon as he start to blame top management um, about lack of strategy. Yeah. Who also thinks that his man top management has no strategy. Also, different team, not ours, but different, should have no interest in project and that is why our morale and uh, motivation, whatever it means, nobody knows what it means, but it decreases, significantly decreases. So, um, the main idea how to deal with statements like this, I got from the book, my favorite one, another favorite book. Uh, does anyone read this? The Skin in the Game. It's Nassim Taleb. I love this very much. And he starts his book with uh, some excerpt about these two guys. It's um, from Greek mythology. Antaeus and Hercules. It's, I think it should be clear. So the idea behind these two guys are as follows. Uh, Antaeus, maybe some of you know, still remember from high school. Antaeus was a god. He was a son, oh, semi-god. I do not know how to call it exactly. He was son of Poseidon and uh, Mother Earth Gia. And he has very strange hobby. He like to wrestle with the strangers, just uh, wrestle with the strangers, and if he win, he take a skull, I said very strange hobby, to build a church, a temple for his father. And he has a cheat. While he was standing on the earth, he had a connection with his mother, and she supplied him with unlimited force or strength. And uh, according to one of uh, stories about Hercules, about his deed, he understood this life hack and he just pulled it to the ear uh, from the ground and he did. I mean, Antaeus, not Hercules. So uh, Talib used the same metaphor uh, to say that as soon as we leave the ground, we are almost dead. We are going to clouds of abstract bullshit. And this idea connects very well with uh, the basics of psychology, of uh, models that describe how do we interact with our external world. The idea, how we get idea about the world itself, how we feel it, looks like following. We have a first layer. First layer is layer of directly observable, observable phenomena. Something that we could touch, we could hear, we could smell. Then all these signals from external world goes to our perception filters. It makes us to feel only small portions of all that signals that are uh, going from external world. Then uh, after perception filters, the signal distorted significantly goes to the conceptual layering machine, some piece of our mind that creates meaning fast, very fast, unconsciously, it creates meaning. Uh, my favorite example of this, how this conceptual layering machine works, is as follows. I will show you a simple shape, not so simple shape, but shape, just plain color, shape, and what do you see here? 
It is only shape and color, but our mind quickly, most likely unconsciously, makes some decisions about this, makes some meanings about this. What is it? Frog, frog two men. I have bad news for you. OK. So then after conceptual layer machine, the rest of information goes to rush generalizations part. How it works in reality, I, I could give you example. One of them, also from fictional IT company. Just for example, at directly observable phenomenal level, we could see the following. Almost every new release that we give to our lovely customer, the customer's team cannot deploy these updates from the first try. It's a directly observable phenomenon. On perception filters go something like this. Oh, they ask the same question over and over again. The same. Uh, it doesn't mean that they really ask the same question over, over and again. They could ask a pile of questions, but our perception filters make us not be aware about different questions. It makes us notice only the same questions. Okay. On conceptual layer machine, it makes the following, that they do not respect our time, they do not respect anyone except themselves, and for them it is easier to ask them to think. So finally, on rush generalizational level, to my assholes, it is clear. And then when you try to work with uh, problems with, uh, with the team, you work on this level. They say our top management has no strategy, our customer is assholes, and we're have, we have no idea what to do with this. But initially, we need to go down to this, to ground level. To ground level. Another example also from another fictional company. For example, the team suddenly once didn't deliver the full scope of the sprint. Do you understand why it is fictional? Because real company never delivers a full scope. So it happens one time. Uh, on, on the perception of filter level, it goes, oh, they didn't f do the feature that product owner or whoever promised to top management. Mm, that sucks, really. On a conceptual layer machine, it goes like this. They're poorly motivated, also as holes. Uh, and on a rash generalizational level, it goes like this. We do not have clearly defined strategy, figetogy, motivational policy, schmolicy, and all other stuff. So we have to, s right now, start develop new uh, estimation, estimation, procedures, reviews, and so on. A lot of, as I remember, uh, Ed said in his talk the term CBI, corporate bullshit. Ah, corporate bullshit in unity. So it is a thing that fights CB. So it is kind of CB. But on the ground level, it might happen like this. Just some simple fault or something else. Be aware of these rush generalizations that live in bullshit clouds. As soon as we leave our ground level, we are almost dead. Because I think it is easily to imagine that uh, when we start just from one maybe small failure on ground level, and as a result, top management started to create new procedures, new processes, and so on, it will kill maybe not only team, but the company itself. So I love this. Because as a consultant, I deal with the companies that are almost dead by means of this uh, corporate bullshit. So the more they kill themselves, the more I paid. It's easy for me. And another feature is the absence of the full picture. It's very hard to deal with this because almost no one has full picture. No one. And when uh, working with a uh, development team also, the significant part of the whole picture is somewhere there. Uh, because business people are not assholes. Uh, they have to demand very fast launches due to some other reasons. Most likely they could create the same tree, maybe even bigger tree, that describes why it happens so. And, uh, 
just another example, uh, also a kind of absence of full picture. It happens or it appear in uh, problems or statements like this. For example, we do not have someone. Uh, does anyone think that the root problem in his case is that they do not have some person role or something else? Because it is uh, not the rule, but heuristic that absence of solution is not the problem itself. And it is my favorite pattern that we do not have senior engineer, manager, product owner. It is my favorite pattern. It means that uh, our problem, in general case, have been created by those who already left, but will be solved by those we will hire soon. It's also typical. And maybe the second popular problem after top managements are assholes. So it looks like this. What does it mean? Uh, why this one is not the problem itself? Most likely, this is a bullshit cloud. And when you try to go to the ground, to the ground again, uh, you may found something like this. Just for example, every sprint, we have a plenty of unplanned tasks. Uh, it's clear that our product owner is asshole. Is it clear? No, not exactly. Uh, maybe, maybe we could try to make sprint shorter. Maybe, maybe we could uh, try to make user stories smaller. Maybe, maybe we could try backlog grooming before planning sessions in advance. Maybe, maybe we, it's we, 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 and here is HR department. So clearly, maybe it, this one is root cause because HR department also has holes. Okay. Maybe. Okay. So that is the problem. Uh, uh, one of the cases of absence of full picture. As soon as you get full pictures, many, many miracles could uh, have their explanation. My favorite video about this, about full picture and explanation of magic tricks is this one. I could try to show you. Maybe some of you have seen this video already. Oh, oh, oh. The straw. Three, two, one. Whoa! Oh, oh. Where did it go? Where did it go? Where did it go? All the way. Whoa! <laughs> what? <laughs> no, no, Jesus! Oh no, no, Jesus! No, 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 no. Fucking miracle. So you see that full picture describes many, many problems. Uh, but it is extremely hard to get it anyway. So in practice, really, it is very uh, complicated to use uh, this current reality tree due to this, at least these three obstacles. And another one, maybe more significant, is that everything is highly interconnected highly, very highly interconnected. So uh, did anyone try to do this graph or tree by himself? Most likely you will get a pile of sticky notes with pile of uh, arrows here and there. Everything in real life is very highly interconnected. And just for example, to understand what does it mean highly interconnected, uh, recently I've uh, read a paper, scientific paper about depression, because uh, I deal with uh, psychology, procrastinatology, and other sciences like this. So no need to read this just to have an impression that there are a lot of states, a lot of uh, causes. Just for example, it is a depression, uh, how depression works inside only one head and uh, all symptoms, how them are in interconnected. For example, there is a dysfunctional behavior, it increases negative cognitive repetition in the same case, in uh, another turn. It uh, affects biased attention, biased attention, then increases perceived stress, and then increases negative effect, and also increases dysfunctional behavior. One cycle, then we have another cycle. Here, somewhere here, we have sleep deprivation, we have some physiological problem, uh, somewhere we have uh, even sociological, economic status on physical health, 
everything is highly interconnected. So it is uh, only the scheme of what happens inside one people, one man head, and team typically contain more than one people, maybe. So the reality m might be more complicated than just five sticky notes on the flip chart. So that is why in many cases it might be a very good idea just to guess where your root cause is. And the heuristic is as follows. The root cause is very close to what it feels like a conflict. Conflict or conflict also is a very close to compromise. As soon as you see some place when you forced to find a compromise, the conflict is nearly somewhere there. So let us go to the uh, find the proper solution. Either you find the root cause by means of uh, current reality tree or just guess. Anyway, if you have this root cause, you should find the proper solution. And it's not so simple either. Uh, what do I mean? Because uh, typically any root cause relies or exists due to core conflict. And unfortunately, everything we know about conflicts typically is wrong. Uh, you know, uh, Conflict, as it seems, in real life or in our heads, in our heads, the conflict, we have impression from maybe Hollywood movies where typical conflict structure is uh, like this. We have a good guy, a hero. We have a bad guy, an asshole. Uh, but in the reality, it's not like this. If any conflict was like this, the solution would be very simple. Extremely simple. Just good guy kills bad guy and poof, problem solved. It's easiest case. It's very easy case. Very easy to solve. Unfortunately, as this words, wording came from ancient Buddhist uh, philosophy, we do not see things as they are. We see things as we are, most likely. So in real life, typically, Conflict is not good guy, bad guy. In real life, conflict looks like this. Good guy, good guy. And everyone think another guy is an asshole. Like this. And uh, to solve this situation, it's much more complicated. And as Eliyahu Goldert wrote in one of his amazing books, any situation, whenever you would face a situation which requires a compromise, there always is very simple solution that doesn't involve compromise. Unfortunately, to find a very simple solution is extremely hard. Unfortunately. But uh, he has very nice tool to find this solution that doesn't involve compromise. It's called uh, the conflict resolution diagram. I love this very much. Only this tool may be the most powerful among all other thinking tools of theory of constraints. And uh, this diagram always looks the same. It always contains five boxes. First of all, typically we have a common objectives. Remember, we have a situation not good guy, bad guy. We have good guy and good guy. So if we face situation with two good guys, at least something they should have in common, common objective. And one guy, one side, to meet this objective should follow the requirement A. Another guy should follow requirement B. Typically, there is no conflict between these requirements. But in order to have requirement A, one part should have a prerequisite A, something. And another part you might guess, should follow prerequisite B. And typically, there is a problem. There is a problem. So uh, I will give you example, again, from fictional IT company. I have a lot of fictional IT companies, uh, several every month. Uh, just for example, uh, they want to deliver new features fast and with good quality. Why not? From one side, they have to get information about any changes quickly. And changes happens often. 
from another side, they must work on a task on focused mode. Also, it's maybe quite clear, no conflict here, but in order to get information about any changes quickly, the team members have to turn on notifications for new messages on Slack and all other shitty chats. On other hand, as you might guess, yeah, for working on task on focused mode, they should turn off notification messages. And there is a conflict. So you see, from one point of view, we want finally deliver fast and with a good quality. From another point of view, we also would like to have uh, this goal met, deliver fast and with good quality. So what should we do? And as uh, Goldrat wrote, maybe many of you have heard already that as soon as you define a problem precisely, it is uh, almost a halfway to a solution. And Eliyahu Goldrat wrote that the diagram conflict resolution diagram is considered to be maybe the best tool for uh, precisely describing the problem itself. So how can we do this to solve the problem, to find the, the solution? It can be used like this. Uh, we start to think about assumptions. Assumptions that lay behind every cause-effect arrow, cause-effect link. And we are trying to find either false assumption or an assumption that we can make false by some our invention, some our action, or some, something like this. In this fictional example, we could follow this rule and see, uh, in order to work on task in focus mode, we have to turn off notification for new messengers because every notification distracts even if it is not important. And uh, every time we get this assumption, we should think, is it true in our case? In some cases, it might be true. In some cases, it might be not. So if it's true in our case, OK, we have uh, uh, no bad feelings about this cause-effect arrow. OK, let us leave it, leave it here. Let us go to here, another one. Uh -huh. In order to deliver, deliver new features fast, and with good quality, we must work on task and focused mode because uh, we are most productive in case of no interruptions. Is it true? Actually, no. <laughs> it's not often the case. Uh, in my second book, unfortunately in Russian, because uh, I have not translated novel of my book in English, I have some links, references to scientific papers where they test uh, how notifications and interruptions affect speed and precision of solving tasks. So in case of simple tasks, no effect at all. But in case of uh, complicated problems, uh, when the subjects have to supposed to solve complicated problems, it significantly in several times increased time to need to solve the problem and in several times multiplied uh, number of error, error rate. In case of simple problems, simple tasks, nothing else. It doesn't matter at all, actually. So, uh, so that, that is why we should think and consider assumptions behind this arrow. Is it true in our case or not? Okay, maybe true, maybe not. For someone it is true, for someone it is not. Here, another link. In order to deliver new features fast and with good quality, we have to get information about any changes quickly because the sooner we know about task or something else, the sooner we start to implement it. In some cases, it is true. In some, it is not. Also, another assumption. To get information about any changes quickly, we have to turn on notification messages because there is no other way to know about information with necessary speed. So is it true in our case or not? So in some cases it might be true, in some cases it might be not. In namely, that fictional company, they were thinking about this one assumption and decided just to, it was a very straightforward decision, uh, invite product owner on every start uh, stand-up meeting. 
So in that fictional company, they fixed it quite straightforward. Do you want another example? Because uh, I have a lot of examples from uh, fictional companies. Uh, because uh, only for this uh, diagram, because uh, I think it is most powerful tool. Another example. In order to be the most valuable, reliable partner for our lovely customer, from one side, we have to deliver precisely what product owner said, precisely. From another point, we have to ensure delivery of committed scope. So no conflict here, typically. But in order to deliver precisely what product owner wants, uh, we have to create get new tasks in the middle of the sprint. Also, more or less, uh, typical pain in the ass of most of the team. Get new tasks in the middle of the sprint. Uh, in order to ensure delivery of committed scope, we should not include new tasks in the current sprint. So here is uh, how diagram looks like. So let us go and find, examine assumptions behind all this cause effect links. For example, uh, in order to ensure delivery of committed scope, uh, I have to do not allow new task in the current sprint because uh, I have no brain to include contingency in our plans. It might be true, it might be not. In order to be the most reliable partner, I have to ensure delivery of committed scope because product owner on that side, on his turn, also deal with the very strict deadlines. So if uh, some, uh, some of you have heard how it looks like working with the Russian government, you might get an idea. Because in some cases, you might be even present. I think it might increase motivation. You know, if you fail a sprint, you are in prison for two years. A <laughs> lot of time to retrospect. A <laughs> lot of time. Yes. Okay, so in order to be the most reliable partner, on the other hand, we have to deliver precisely what product owner wants because he and only he knows what the best for business. Also, in some cases it is true, in some cases it is not. In order to deliver precisely what product owner expects, we have to get new tasks into the sprints because he changes very frequently. So that is how the diagram looks like. Uh, does it look like a fictional company? Also in that, namely that fictional company, uh, we were working on this assumption as well. And uh, we find out that product owner changes user stories frequently because um, he has very little feedback. He, uh, on the planning session, he was satisfied with the planning. Then when uh, he see intermediate results, in the middle of the sprint, he said that it's not what I want, so let us change it and so on. So we decided to meet, uh, to perform some uh, daily demo for that product owner, daily, or every other day. So three to four demos per week. And uh, also this problem disappeared. So changes were not so frequent, or at least they were early in sprint. Sprint was uh, one month, so maybe not common sprint length for most of people, no? Uh, one month, so uh, first week was not so sensible for changes. Uh, another, another example, the last one from fictional company. Uh, in order uh, to ensure fast delivery of new features in changing environment, fastly changing environment. From one hand, uh, guys had to reduce activities in sprint that do not burn down the backlog, or some managers say uh, non-value added activities. It means planning, uh, retrospectives, uh, grooming, and all, uh, all other stuff, that because they do not provide us story points. From another hand, uh, we have to be ready to adjust our plan, plans quicker. In order to reduce activities in the sprint that do not burn down uh, the backlog, we have to make sprint longer. Why not? And in order to be ready to adjust our plans quicker, we have to make our sprint 
Schroeder. Do you see the conflict behind this? And again, we start to think about assumptions. Uh, in order to reduce activities in sprint that do not burn down backlog, we have to make sprint longer because surprisingly, either we have one week sprint or two or four or six planning retrospectives kills one day anyway. Anyway, namely for that company, for that fictional company, because it may be not your case. It strongly depends on context, but in that company, it was the case. So in order to ensure uh, fast delivery, they have to reduce activities in sprint that do not add value because the same people take part here and there. So it would be nice if uh, one person uh, participate on retrospective, another one in the planning session and whole team is working. It would be the best solution. But it's not uh, the case either. Uh, also, to ensure the fast delivery, we have to be ready to adjust our plans quickly because uh, work and uh, requirements appear unexpectedly from here and there. And also, we have to be ready to adjust our plans in order to adjust our plans to quicker, we have to make sprint shorter because uh, for us it is very true pain to change something inside the sprint. So it is a maybe typical conflict that lies behind uh, those teams that decide to turn from Scrum to something named Kanban or s and sort of at least because there are not too much teams that follow real Kanban. So that that's how it works. That's how it works. So is it complicated? Yes. Actually, yes. So behind any example from fictional company is about half or maybe full day of work, screaming, uh, shouting, and also interrogating each other and other funny stuff. So uh, analyzing assumptions, it might happen that you find something that make any assumption wrong. And then here, this uh, something that make an assumption wrong becomes a solution. So it re the rest uh, is just to implement it. Also, it is not so simple. Uh, we have a huge pain behind this one. And uh, initially, I didn't plan to talk about how to implement solution because it, is, uh, it could take maybe several hours. And some aspects of this I will cover tomorrow uh, during eight hours workshop. So that is why I just uh, give you some simple hints about this. Uh, first hint is an uh, example from another fictional company from some fictional case. Um, we decided to introduce the power hour practice. In some cases, uh, in some teams, they like this. What does it mean, uh, power hour practice? Uh, most of you most likely fed up with interruptions, uh, with uh, poking fingers into your body, asking for something, asking for assistance, for help. So the team decided that let us make uh, the morning dedicated for some valuable stuff, power hour. From 9 to 11, do not interrupt each other. So very nice solution, yes? Uh, who is fed up with the uh, interruptions? Who would like them to disappear? I, I think almost everyone, almost everyone. So it happens on this session like this. Yeah. Do we hate interruptions? Yes! Do we want to work our uh, work in focused mode? Yes! So let us do not interrupt each other. So what is the response? Fuck you. <laughs> because this one would like to have power hour from 9 to 11, another one from 13 to 15, another one cannot work because he is um, uh, some guy, he called it an owl in, in Russian, it literally can be translated, because uh, his brain doesn't work before 7 liters of coffee and uh, 5 p.m. Okay, and they continue to interrupt each other. So it's very complicated. Even if you have uh, the solution itself, it is extremely hard to implement it into the team itself. Also, the main ideas how to do it are I took from this 
book from this guy, uh, Sam Keener, not Kim Keener. Kim Keener is his brother, and he wrote Lessons Learned in Software Testing. My favorite book was in my previous life. So uh, my previous life, I said that uh, from 13, when I was 13 years old, I earned my first money by programming, and then I was working in this industry for 20 years. And then I some, start my own consulting business. So about seven years, I work on my own. So I love Kim Keener. I loved him in my previous life, and in my current life, I do love his brother. And also, those who understand Russia, I do have two books. Uh, also, I have some drafts, um, first three chapters translated in English of my first book, first three chapters. So if you wish, you could just take a look at this for free. Uh, if I receive a lot of comments like, Max, I, we need all others, other chapters translated and so on, maybe I will invest time, money, in my passion to make translation for the rest of the first book, at least first book. But who does read in Russian? Lucky guys. Uh, and finally, anyway, uh, while you're trying to implement something, be ready to iterate, because nothing works from first try. Nothing works. My favorite picture on this, also uh, with Russian favor. Have you seen this? Lada. Perfect from the beginning. Often it's not the case. So uh, very often uh, what we have at the beginning is the crap. So we need to version 2.0, 3.0, 4.0, and maybe version 5.0, we would have something that would work. So when we talk about rules inside the team, it's also kind of software. It's very close to developing a software. But unlike uh, the computer software, uh, our software or team rules are executed by not CPUs, but by humans. And humans are very funny creatures, very funny creatures. So I will tell a lot about this tomorrow. Who is going to attend workshop tomorrow, my workshop tomorrow? I will tell you in more details. So let us go back. Solving problem is easy on the very first level. It's very easy. Yeah, you just identify the root cause, you just find the proper solution, implement it, maybe from second try it will work, or fifth try. Also, for more details, uh, if someone wish to know, to dig deeper into these topics, I strongly recommend at least these three books. But they are very helpful for managers or for those who are on that way to become a manager. Thinking process, facilitating groups, or how to deal with leap humans, and theory of constraints. Just Torah of management and Torah of business. And the last thing, or maybe the only thing that would be nice if you take away from here is that no one is an asshole. No one is an asshole. So, thank you. <laughs>